Can you understand why using the SPR as the strategic midterm reserve is a short-sighted decision that only leaves this country even more exposed to the whims of OPEC Plus next year? No, look, I disagree. We said that the, the OPEC decision was short-sighted precisely because the lack of supply and reliable supply continues to be the dominant challenge globally in energy markets. The lack of supply continues to be the dominant risk. And the use of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in a historic but calibrated way starting last, uh, last winter. <laughs> That's a prudent use of the asset as a transition as U.S. producers ramp up. You say it's a prudent use of the asset. Other people are very worried about this. You've drained the SPR to its lowest level in four decades. There's some accusation that you're using, you're putting the polls before America's energy security. Boom! Brian, the Saudis themselves said this morning that the U.S. requested a one-month delay to the OPEC Plus output. I wonder why that would be. Brian, can you tell me whether you did ask the Saudis for a one-month delay to that decision? Are they telling the truth? Look, we clearly, we clearly communicated our views to OPEC members that we thought it was short-sighted for them to take uh, the action that they were contemplating, and they announced. <laughs> And you didn't answer the question, so I'm going to ask it again. Damn! I'm going to share with you and share with our audience the quote from the Saudis this morning. The government of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia would like to clarify that based on its belief in the importance of dialogue and exchange of views with its allies and partners outside of OPEC Plus regarding the situation in the oil markets, the government of the Kingdom clarified through its continuous consultation with the US administration that all economic analyses indicate that postponing the OPEC Plus decision for a month, according to what has been suggested, would have had negative economic consequences. Brian, again, it's a really straight question. Did you ask the Saudis to delay that decision for a month. Are they telling the truth or not? Look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to, to uh, get on, on, on air and disclose private conversations that well, members of our private. administration the have with shared it with us. With you've got the opportunity to say it's true or not. Is it true or not? What I will say, what I will say, what I will say clearly is that the communications that we've had with OPEC members and continuing have been based on our assessment of the economic circumstances of supply and demand in global oil markets. We engagements international. Again, they're suggesting it's a political one that your strategy is political, that your reference to energy I understand what they're suggesting, and what I'm saying to you is that our... Look in the eyes. Larry gets nailed with the left hand, the right hand. Digs to the body. Goes to draw right hand. Gets clipped with a big right hand. He won't get up from this one. It's all over. Joe Cortez. Alright, today is Tuesday, October 18th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and this is going to be one of these shows when we take the gloves off, because, ladies and gentlemen, what's about to happen tomorrow is a national disaster. What's about to happen tomorrow is a global economic disaster. And if you think that you have seen the worst of oil prices moving higher, and the prices that you're paying at the pump, Buddy, you have no idea what's about to hit you. Buckle up. Now, we're going to talk about all of this in details in tonight's program, but let's digress and talk about the tape for a little bit because today we have seen yet another rally. The market continues to go higher because it found a new source of optimism, and this source of optimism is earnings. You might have heard the bullshit narrative on TV and the media that earnings are better than expected, that corporate earnings are beating expectations, and the economy is doing fine. Now, there is a difference between earnings beating some analysts' expectations and between earnings being actually good or not. And I'm going to cover earnings by the end of the week, one by one, and I'm going to show you the alarming signs that we've gotten so far. Yet the market is becoming too comfortable now with the new source of optimism. But my hunch is it's going to get to the point of arrogance, and then what do you know, one of these major earnings will bomb. We will see a contagion across the market because once again the warning signs are here. You might have heard the news by midday that some Apple suppliers are saying they're cutting the production targets for the iPhone 14. Yet the market continues to say, okay, okay, that, that's just noise. Let's continue to go higher because we have seen some good earnings, quote unquote. And oh, by the way, the Fed is going to pivot. They're still holding onto the hopes that the Fed is going to pivot 
and that inflation is going down. No regard to the CPI going higher month over month. No regard to the core PCE going higher month over month. No regard to inflation expectations moving higher again. And no regard to what's about to happen tomorrow. The disaster in the energy market. All of that is noise for now. They continue to hold on into the hope that the Fed is going to pivot because inflation is going down. This is delusion and reality is going to hit sooner or later. But they're getting these sources of optimism sometimes fake. For example, overnight we got the news that the Bank of England is delaying the return of quantitative tightening and the stock market futures shot up higher. Then shortly after came the correction, the Bank of England said that the reports are inaccurate and there is no plans to delay the return to QT. But for now, the market is desperate for any source of optimism to create a rally. And this is going to be the case until the wake-up call hits. But folks, for tonight's program, I want to cover the energy markets in details because we have an important decision coming out by the administration tomorrow. So let's dive right into it, and here it is. In focus tonight. More depletion of the SPR coming out tomorrow. This is yet another disaster that will hit the energy market and we will see inflation moving higher. No doubt about it. This will not fix inflation. This will add more gasoline to the fire. And I will explain to you in details why that is. Now, in response to higher energy prices in 2021, the Biden administration decided to deplete the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, also known as the SPR. But nobody anticipated back then that the degree of depletion of the SPR will be so extreme to the point where it depleted about three decades worth of reserves in a matter of months. And despite all of this dangerous and reckless depletion of the SPR, oil prices remain elevated, historically speaking. And with the depletion of the SPR, OPEC Plus smelled blood, and they seized on the opportunity earlier this month by cutting production by about 2 million barrels per day. Now OPEC Plus would argue that demand is going down, and all what they're doing right now is stabilizing the market by moving supply closer to demand. But regardless, the impact was higher oil prices, although the majority of the gains came in anticipation of the decision, not in the aftermath. In reality, oil prices actually went down in the aftermath of the decision by OPEC+. Plus. But the damage was already done. The Biden administration took this personally, and they blamed Saudi Arabia, accusing them of playing politics and favors to Russia by cutting down production to keep prices elevated. And now we have a tit-for-tat dispute with the largest producer in the world. And now the administration is exploring options on how to retaliate against Saudi Arabia. And even the president suggested perhaps cutting military ties with the country. Take a look. Welcome back. Saudi Arabia confirming that President Biden did attempt to coerce the kingdom into postponing any oil production cut until after the midterm elections. Democrats are now wanting the U.S. to temporarily halt all arms sales to the Saudis as a punishment. Here's what President Biden had to say about this yesterday. Right now, they're calling for a stopping of U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Do you support that legislation? We're going to react to Saudi Arabia. We're going to do any consultation when they come back, and uh, we will take action. And of course, Saudi Arabia responded by saying uh, the Biden administration actually approached them and suggested delaying the production cuts until after the midterms, which is a big political scandal here, because if it is true that we know for sure the administration is playing politics, and they just want to give us the illusion that they are fighting inflation right before the midterms. And after they secure the votes, they say, hey, folks, thanks for voting. Now enjoy higher prices all the way till the next election. Yet in reality, gasoline prices have been rising at the pump since before the OPEC Plus decision. For example, gasoline prices here in the state of California have been rising since about a month or so, and they have now reached about 8 bucks a gallon. But of course, as everything with this administration and the Federal Reserve, they have to dodge and blame something else, be it Putin, be it Saudi Arabia, be it Jupiter and Mars, it doesn't matter. They have to blame something. Matter of fact, according to the Harvard the Harris poll, when voters are asked, do you consider the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia an ally, neutral, or an enemy? The majority say neutral, 55%. And when it comes to the question of should the United States cut military ties with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, about 54% say yes, 46% say no. So it's about split down the middle here. In other words, this is not gonna land politically speaking. We'll talk about the politics and the polls in a minute, but we know that we have an oil war right now. 
between the United States and OPEC Plus. The problem is, one has a lot of options, that is OPEC Plus, they can cut down production even more. And then another side, the United States, running out of options. The SPR to begin with is already depleted to dangerous territories, and the begging tour, be it Iran, be it Venezuela, be it Iraq, whatever, none of these begging tours are working. Venezuela is not interested in increasing production without major and substantial left off in sanctions by the United States, and the same goes with Iran. So when we heard the news today that the administration is about to do something tomorrow to address the increasing prices of energy, specifically gasoline at the pump, we started to wonder, is it going to be a deal with another country? That's not foreseeable. Is it going to be opening the spigots here? Well, that's not foreseeable because the administration has been waging a war against against domestic oil producers and pursuing aggressive green energy policies. So what is it going to be? And my hunch was more depletion from the SPR. But this is what we heard, the teaser from the Secretary of Energy, Granholm, who's not even qualified to be a dog catcher, let alone energy secretary. But here it is. The White House has confirmed that it will make an announcement on gas prices tomorrow. What can we expect? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the White House on it. Suffice it to say that the president, you know, if there's one thing that makes him lose sleep at night, it's that people are paying more money for, for energy. And the, the gas, gas at the pump is the most visible, uh, you know, manifestation of that. And of course, we all remember Granholm last year when she asked about increasing the domestic supply of oil. She laughed about it. Take a look. What is the Granholm plan to increase oil production in America? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> that is hilarious. How reliant are we on OPEC Plus? I do wonder, and I don't think it's funny. And here's John Farrow once again putting her in her corner. This is not funny. I don't find it funny laughing when people are suffering, all because of your stupid and misguided energy policies. But we knew ahead of time that something about the SPR is going to happen. And the market was worried that we would see about 100 million barrels being released from the SPR. And today, after the bell, we got the confirmation, the breaking news. And here it is. Kayla. Hi, Scott. I've just learned from my sources that President Biden tomorrow is expected to announce a further release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the range of 10 to 15 million barrels, according to my sources. Now, uh, the goal of this uh, additional release uh, that would extend the releases through the month of December would be to offset some volatility in the market that is expected once the European oil embargo goes into place on December 5th, which is expected to drive prices even higher higher for consumers. What remains to be seen is whether the administration will go beyond the 180 million barrel release that was first outlined in March, and if so, how much farther they will go. The White House and the Department of Energy have not responded to requests for comment on this. I am told that in addition to the announcement tomorrow that will be made about these further releases and the extension of the releases will be a mechanism that the Department of Energy is seeking to put in place to replenish the reserves at a fixed price. Now, last week, officials from the department held various calls with uh, industry executives about uh, the range of prices that they would be looking at. I'm told that range was about $70 a barrel, although those conversations are still live, they're still fluid, but the government is trying to put some price certainty on oil several years into the future. Remains to be seen how exactly that will work, but that's what we're expecting from the administration tomorrow. Scott. Now, I don't know if you caught it or not, but they said that the administration is going to release millions of barrels from the SPR to push the prices down to about 70 bucks a barrel, and then they're going to replenish the SPR. What a dumb strategy. But once again, is it really about a sound energy policy? Is it really sincerely about reducing the pain at the pump? Or is it just another PR disaster just before the midterms? And this is exactly what the press secretary was pushed on against today. And here's the response. Take a look. Do you have any response to those who would say, who are criticizing the White House, saying that this seems like a ploy ahead of the midterms? Look, the president, I, I would say to, this to, to folks, um, should the president not do everything that he can to lower prices? Uh, should he not continue to keep his prime, promise to give American people a little bit of breathing room? You know, that's the promise that he's made. Should he not do that?
And so that's what you're seeing right now. Uh, this is something that he has done throughout the summer. Uh, this is something that he has done uh, to address Putin's price hike. Again, it's bullshit. It's dodging. It's propaganda. It's Putin's fault. Putin this, Putin that. And you know what? I feel bad for this press secretary because she doesn't have the propaganda in her. She doesn't have the lying in her. She gets frustrated. And of course, I miss the previous propaganda minister, Saki. She was a master in this game. Not this one, though. And again, she got pressed about why is the release of the SPR happening right now, right before the midterms. Take a look. One more on the SPR release. Some White House officials have been talking for the last few days about the fact that it's a possibility. Um, can you explain why, with gas prices, you mentioned earlier the gas prices are going down again. Why would the U.S. need another SPR release from that 180 million um, barrels that you already announced? Why would you need that now if prices are already dropping? So again, I'm not going to get ahead of the, the president. Uh, as you know, there's going to be an announcement uh, tomorrow on uh, the president's uh, um, policy, next move, uh, his next move forward on what he's going to do to help uh, the American people, give them, continue to give them a little bit of a breathing room. Uh, but President Biden has said for months how he is committed to doing everything that he can uh, in his power to address Putin's price hike. He has said this in almost every speech that you've heard him uh, talk about when it comes to uh, gas prices and what what the American people are seeing and feeling at the pump, and he's been delivering on that. So, uh, you know, as you know, gas prices have indeed come down. I just listed some of the states uh, where we had seen a, a, an increase, and now we're seeing a decline this past week. Uh, they came down at the fastest pace in over a decade this summer and have continued to fall in recent days. And But at the same time, P Putin's war continues. His war uh, on Ukraine, his unprovoked war, brutal war on, on Ukraine, continues. And so it puts pressure on our global energy supplies because of this war. And again, Putin, 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 everything is Putin. Everything that goes wrong in the world is Putin's fault. I woke up late, that's Putin's fault. I forgot to eat the broccoli in the plate, that's Putin's fault. I forgot to bang my wife and now she's banging the personal trainer, that's Putin's fault. But here's what's really dangerous about all of this. The SPR is already depleted. The United States of America consumes about 20 million barrels a day. Do the math. If the SPR right now is standing at around 350 to 400 million barrels, that is the equivalent of about 17 to 20 days worth of consumption. What happens if, God forbid, an actual disaster hits? A big one. Say a major earthquake in the state of California. What are we going to do if that happens? What are we going to do if we have an actual war? And that is entirely possible. We're now even talking about a nuclear war with Russia. What happens if the aliens decide to invade? We're shit out of luck. We don't have anything in the SPR barely 17 to 20 days worth of consumption and they're about to deplete the SPR even further. Now here's why this is actually bullish for oil prices not bearish and it will likely lead to higher oil prices not lower. You see the administration said that they're gonna use the 80 bucks floor to replenish the SPR and immediately oil prices shot up higher. Because if you say that 80 is the floor the market will take prices all the way to 90 and on top of that now the government has to buy millions of barrels to replenish the SPR. So now they decided to retract and say, okay, not 80, let's do 70 bucks a barrel. It doesn't matter. The market is going to look at it as you're depleting the SPR, and at some point in the near future, you're going to have to buy millions of barrels on the open market. So prices will move higher in anticipation of that. And if that was not enough, we know that comes December 5th, the European ban on Russian energy imports and the price cap on Russian oil will be in effect. And we're now getting bad leading indicators from Russia. For example, the headline reads, Sakhalin oil projects hints that the potential collapse of Russian output when new EU sanctions take effect. Now, if the Russian output will be damaged substantially this winter and the US already depleting the SPR, we will have a massive imbalance between demand and supply, leading to higher oil prices. So the only remedy left will be crushing the demand aggressively, meaning more and more aggressive action by the central bank, the Federal Reserve to crush the economy to get the supply and demand into balance. And this will be dangerous and have severe ramifications for the economy. And the question now becomes, why deplete the SPR? Why not open the spigots in this country? Why not allow all of these oil companies to produce more oil and gas? Well, the response to that is, even if they want to, even if they want to violate the green energy agenda and allow the spigots to be open, the energy companies will say, no thanks. 
We're happy where we are right now. Higher energy prices means higher margins and more money to the investors of our companies. No thanks. We're not going to open the spigots right now and participate in our own death when the administration says we want an end to fossil fuels as a source of energy in this country. When the policy is so hostile against oil companies, there is no cooperation between the administration and producers. They're not interested. And folks, I don't speak for myself. This is not just my opinion, that this is a misguided policy by the administration. The majority of Americans agree. According to the same poll by Harvard Harris, the question is, do you support or oppose the energy and gas policies of the Biden administration? The majority, 54% say oppose, 46% say support. We will look at independence. 64% say oppose. When voters are asked, do we need to emphasize lower gasoline prices and energy independence or, listen to this, higher gasoline prices and climate change? The vast majority, the overwhelming majority, 80%, say that they want lower prices and energy independence. Only 20% of voters say that climate change is such a priority that we have to accept higher gasoline prices right now. So who is the administration catering to right now? When you have 80% of voters say that this is a misguided policy, open the spigots, let us deal with the problem that we have right now. And while we build the future of green energy, let us not suffer until that day comes when the transition is ready, when we have the infrastructure, the resources for the transition to happen. According to the same poll, when voters are asked, do you think President Biden's policies are responsible for most of the increase in gasoline prices, or are his policies not responsible? The vast majority, once again, 62% say responsible. It's not Putin. It's not Saudi Arabia. It's the energy policy by the administration, 62%. Now, when the same voters are asked, should the transition to green energy happen immediate, no matter what the cost, or should it be gradual as the technology is developed and our domestic fuels are used up? The vast majority once again say it has to be gradual, 65%. Only 35% say it should be immediate. And folks, in this channel, I've been pointing out the misguided policy by the administration over and over and over again. This abrupt transition to green energies will cause inflation because the mines are not developed for lithium, for nickel, for cobalt, for graphite, for aluminum. We don't have enough supply to do the transition, the abrupt transition right now to produce all of these electric vehicles, for example. Yet it became a cult-like thinking here in the automobile industry in the United States that the transition should be abrupt to the point where auto manufacturers such as GM and Ford decided to scrap all of these assembly lines for combustion engine cars. They even let go of hybrid cars, which I believe was a major mistake, is a major mistake, and they went all in to produce these EVs. And they're now surprised that they don't have the lithium. They don't have ample supplies of nickel, aluminum, cobalt, even copper. And they're paying an arm and a leg to secure these supplies. Because it's not only them competing on these supplies, it's Chinese automobile manufacturers, it's European automobile manufacturers, everybody has gone into this abrupt shift into green energy and they're all competing on the same scarce resources, pushing prices higher and higher and higher. We should have at least kept producing hybrid cars. We should have at least kept the spigots going on until all of these resources are secured and until all of the EV manufacturing is ready to go. But no, it had to be abrupt. And when I pointed out this in the past, I got criticized by the viewers, saying, Hey Maverick, what are you against the environment? What are you, you don't believe in the science? What's wrong with you? And I said, folks, it's not about the science. It's not about being pro or against the environment. It's about what makes sense. It's about reason and logic. I want to transition to green energy, but the transition has to be smooth. It has to be done without causing major economic disruption, like we're seeing right now with inflation, with reduced supplies of new vehicles, with out-of-commission refineries, pushing prices at the pump higher and higher and higher. This is a disaster. But the good news is, even the propagandists, even the tools who've been saying, no, we should go all in in the transition to green energy and now capitulating. And they're saying, okay, maybe we should take a break here. Maybe we should do this transition in a more rational way. For example, listen to CIA propagandist Fried Zakaria. I was watching CNN over the weekend and I was shocked that he actually said this on air. Take a look. Washington sanctions have been well planned and well executed with one exception, energy. If the goal is to reduce Moscow's oil revenues, the sensible strategy, assuming you can't cut off all Russian oil supplies, would be to allow 
petroleum to flow unrestricted while working on a long-term plan to reduce Western dependence on Russian energy. That way, for now, supply would stay plentiful, which means prices would stay low. Instead, Western countries announced an embargo on Russian oil. The price cap on Russian oil, now proposed, is an effort to correct these mistakes and essentially negate the effect of the oil embargo. So were the efforts to get Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states to pump more oil, which have failed. The Saudis miscalculated how badly their decision would go down in Washington, and it will cause a rupture in relations between the two countries. But the larger problem is the West's incoherent energy strategy. It has underinvested in the energy it actually uses today, which is fossil fuels, based on magical thinking about the energy of tomorrow, renewables, which really will come the day after tomorrow. The greatest danger to the United States is that much of this economic war is being waged by America alone, using the unique status of the dollar as its weapon. Because countries need to use the one truly global currency, the threat to cut them off from it allows for extensive sanctions that can touch on goods and services that are not even produced in America. The dollar hit a two-decade high last month because of the lack of alternatives to it. But at the same time, many major countries, from India to Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Turkey, Indonesia, and of course China, are searching for ways to shake off the hold of U.S. currency and escape the long reach of Washington's economic power. And he is absolutely right. The ramifications of these misguided policies and this international hegemony with either you're with us and you will obey and do whatever we want, or we're going to sanction, bully, hit, isolate you. Well, guess what's going on in response? Countries such as China, India, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Brazil are all now exploring ways to trade commodities with alternative currencies by avoiding the U.S. dollar. And all you need is these countries, Brazil. Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, India, and China. If they decide to trade commodities using any alternative currency besides the U.S. dollar, this will be the beginning of the end of the petrodollar and the dominance of the United States on the global economy. This is a disaster. We shouldn't even entertain the possibility of this happening. But here we are. And a huge part of the reason is we're listening to zombies such as Frankenstein, John Kerry. Take a listen. And energy security worry is driving a lot of the thoughts now about, oh, we need more drilling of gas. We need more drilling of this. We need to go back to coal. No, we don't. We absolutely don't. So he say we absolutely don't, but guess what's happening right now? Countries like Germany are consuming more coal. The demand for coal is at all time highs. So this misguided lunacy must stop now. And the decision of releasing more barrels from the SPR will indeed be another disastrous decision that we will pay a dire price for down the road. Now, folks, with that out of the way, let's move on to the coverage of the stock market. We start by the closing of the indices today, and here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 337.98 points, or a gain of 1.12%. The Nasdaq up by 96.60%, 60%, 60 points, or a gain of 0.90%. The S&P 500 up by 42.03 points, or a gain of 1.14%. When it comes to the sector's performances today, all in the green, we're not going to shame anybody here, but at number one, capturing the gold medal, industrials, and number two for the silver, utilities, number three for the bronze, financials, earnings did the heavy lifting here, Lockheed shot up higher, and therefore industrials are shooting up higher. We also had Goldman Sachs shooting up higher, so did financials. We'll talk about that and a lot more in the heat map analysis, but before we do that, here's the advanced to decline ratios, NYSE, 77% advancing versus 21% declining. The Nasdaq, 64% advancing versus 33% declining. On to commodities. Today was a down day for energy commodities, even though the dollar did not move one way or the other by a lot. It was slightly negative, but regardless, we have seen the WTI down about 3.5%, Brent down about 1.5%. Why the need to release more from the SPR? Why? Energy prices are going down. The gasoline RBOB is down 1.25%. Heating oil down 2.5%. Natural gas used to be the party boy down about five percent for the day now natural gas is down lots of profit taking and the reason is the mild winter that we have so far and the argument that europeans are already stocked up for the winter season is the problem it is just one winter storm away one big one and the reserves and storage will go down big and then what a they don't have 
the infrastructure to import more LNG in a short amount of time. Matter of fact, for now, dozens of LNG ships waiting in the coasts of Europe with no place to unload. So this creates an excess supply because all of this has to be redirected to another destination. And the assumption is they will go to Asia. So now we have an oversupply, at least for now. But here's the problem. Once the winter season hits, we have no idea how severe it's going to be or how mild. If it is mild, we will see natural gas going down big. But honestly, whether it is a mild winner or a severe one, it doesn't matter. At some point, the Europeans are going to run out of supply. And then what? They have a complete ban on Russian energy, be it natural gas or oil. And even the Qatari minister today came out, for the energy minister, came out and said, that while Europe has sufficient supplies for now, comes 2023, they will be depleted big time. And then what? Natural gas prices will shoot up higher again. Folks, if you think this inflation is over, if you think the worst is behind us, think again. The worst is yet to come. And then when it comes to softs, we have yet another day worth of gains for OJ, massive gains of about 5%. And this is a heartbreaking story. We know the Hurricane Ian in Florida produced a massive amount of damage in orange plantations, and the losses now could reach $1.5 billion. So without a doubt, we will see prices of OJ a breakfast staple. In American households, we will see the prices of those moving significantly higher. But we also got modest gains for lumber for about 1.5%. Yet all in all, it was a down day for softs led by cocoa with losses of about one and a quarter percent, followed by cotton, coffee, and sugar futures. When it comes to metals, down across the board, so anybody betting on the dollar going down for good, well, we don't have a confirmation by metals. Gold down, silver down, platinum down, copper down about one and a half percent. On the other hand, palladium with a rebound of about one percent for the day. When it comes to meats, green across the board, and the gains were led once again by the new big tech lean hogs. Gains worth about one and three quarters of a percent followed by gains of about one and a half percent by feeder cattle futures and then modest gains of about half a percentage point for live cattle futures when it comes to grains down across the board for the most part with exception of soybean oil futures which closed the day with gains of about two and three quarters of a percent and we know the reason behind this the bombing of sunflower factories in ukraine that reduces the supply of sunflower oil and now consumers have to revert to the alternative which happens to be soybean oil Demand goes higher, supply is still down. The natural conclusion is prices will go higher. <music> Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume is not going higher. The volume is actually calming down a lot. The volume is not saying, hey, this is a legit rally. Otherwise, we would have seen a lot of call options buying the volume moving higher. This is not the case, but we're seeing the ratios improving in certain names. We'll talk about them in a minute, but at number one, the hottest table in the casino today was Apple with around 1 million contracts traded today. And look at this, about 56% of those were puts, not calls. And at number two, Tesla reporting earnings tomorrow with about 720,000 contracts traded today, about 50% of those were calls. And here it is, Amazon at number three, with around 550,000 contracts traded today. And look at this, about 60% of the volume was actually calls. So we have more optimism here in Amazon versus, say, Apple. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker REM, which is the Mortgage Real Estate ETF, meaning when somebody buys calls, they're betting that mortgage rates will go down. And when they buy puts, they're betting that mortgage rates will move higher. In this case, somebody bought calls on the REM, betting that mortgage rates will go down. And they bought the 23 calls for the expiration date, November 18th, with expectations that the REM could move higher and gain more than 6% by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all, spending around $1 million. And then what about the triple Qs, the NASDAQ? Somebody sees more upside here for technology. And they bought the 285 calls for the expiration date, October 26, with expectations that the Qs could add more gains, specifically, about 5% or more by the expiration date. They paid around one buck and 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $1 million. And then we have the ticker GH for Garden Health. The name is down big for the year, but somebody sees a rebound coming, perhaps a bottom, 
We'll see what happens. And the reason is they bought the 55 calls for the expiration date, December 16th, with the expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 17% by then. They paid around 8 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $1.6 million. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker EWJ for the Japanese ETF? Somebody sees more downside coming here. They bought the 46 puts for the expiration date, December 16th, with the expectations that the EWJ WJ could go down and lose more than 5.5% of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $400,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? A sea of green with few exceptions. We have Moderna down, some uh, jab related news, but for the most part, all in all, the market was pretty much in the green with sizable gains. So let's talk about the movers because we don't have any theme that we can follow. We know the algos are buying, we know we have short covering, and this is the tide that lifts all boats. But we have warning signs coming here, folks, and a major one we got overnight from Microsoft, which is now planning to cut around 1,000 jobs. Here it comes. Little by little, we're going to hear more and more companies cutting jobs. Why would they be cutting jobs? How about revenues slowing down? So when the narrative in the market says that earnings season is pretty good and it's going to be the expectations and higher we go, watch out what you're hoping for. And then we got news from the iMob, Apple announcing more crap the ipad pros designed ipad whatever apple tv 4k charging you more for the same crap maybe that was a distraction because soon enough we got the news that apple 14 production is being cut down and immediately in response apple shares went down erasing about three percent worth of gains but by the end of the day came the dismissal that this is a one company one supplier it doesn't really mean anything but we're hearing these stories over and over and over again. It was an isolated supplier a few weeks ago. Here's another one. And next thing you know, when Apple reports, they will come out and pretty much confirm all of this. Now, the iMob doesn't really provide any numbers for the sales of iPhones anymore, but we're gonna catch it. We're gonna see the revenues down. We're gonna see the engagement down. We're gonna see the growth down. And this will be bad news for one of the most important, if not the most important stock in the market. And then, hey, uh, did you catch this? The Pelosi's bought shares in uh, Google, aka Alphabet. They exercised options just before the, <laughs> the proposal of a congressional stock ban. Just slide one more <laughs> right before the ban. I don't know, you follow the Pelosi's or not? Do we buy calls or what? I say the Pelosi's been losing money as of late, so I'll bet against them. But anyways, we have news about Dwack the Quack and its sister uh, app, Parler. Apparently Kanye West is losing his mind and now he decided to buy Parler because he's being bullied. So we have Elon Musk buying Twitter. We have Trump having the uh, truth, social, whatever. Now we got Kanye West buying Parler. And folks, it sounds to me that this is a new trend in the billionaire slash oligarch community. They used to buy sports teams. Now... Now they're competing and buying social media platforms. But anyways, since we're talking about the green energy lunacy in this program, we got news from Rolls-Royce saying that they're going to scrap all of their gas combustion engines altogether by 2030. And they're going to go all in, just like everybody else, in the EV phenomenon. And they announced a new car, the Spectre Electric Coupe, I guess. I don't know about you, but even if I was a billionaire, that wouldn't mean anything to me at all. Driving these Rolls-Royce, Lamborghinis, Ferraris. You get a thrill for a day or two and that's it. Maybe owning uh, luxury and sports cars means something to you, but not to the guy you're listening to right now. And then we have news from Lockheed. Uh, the name reported earnings today and it was a major mover in today's action, perhaps leading the market with gains of about 10% for the day. And the reason was they topped the estimates. Everything is hunky-dory in the company. And oh, by the way, they're adding about $14 billion in share buybacks. So no wonder why the stock went higher. And I'm going to stick with Lockheed here, even though some people in the comments say, hey, Maverick, why are you supporting the MIC, the military industrial complex, with your two pennies? And my rebuttal is, number one, yes, Lockheed Martin fuels wars and conflicts around the world, but they also happen to keep the United States ahead of China and Russia. Without Lockheed, Russia will have the advantage in hypersonic missiles, for example. That's number one. Number two, these uh, criminal-type organizations like Lockheed, Pfizer, JP Morgan, they tend to make great investment opportunities. And the reason is they rob the taxpayer over and over and over again. Free cash, baby. There is no recession here. In the big pharma companies, 
in Lockheed, there is no recession because the government robs the taxpayer and pays top dollar to these companies. It's all a money laundering operation. But that leads me to number three. If these criminals are going to make money, how about the little guy getting a taste of that? Meaning, if the government is going to rob me and take my taxpayer money and send it to Ukraine for money laundering uh, purposes, I'd like to have some of that money back. I'd like to have a taste of the money they're making. So I buy Lockheed. and Lockheed is a big year to date. The stock is beating the S&P 500. So I get some of that money back. That's how I look at it. But anyways, we have yet another criminal organization that reported earnings in the morning today, and that is Goldman Sachs. And I bet against Goldman Sachs yesterday, and I was wrong. The stock shot up higher by about 3% or so right after the report, yet it closed down at the lows of the day, be it with gains of a little over 1%. Now, my thesis was, number one, the profits will be down big, specifically trading profits investment profits and number two we have a technical pattern of a reverse abc pattern in the making i was right in one part of the theory which is profits will be down and guess what profits were down big we're talking about 44 percent year over year but regardless of all of that the stock decided to shoot up higher the momentum was so strong the stock moved higher so the question that i got today was hey maverick how are you managing the trade are you going to average down? Are you going to bail out? What are you going to do? The answer is, when your thesis is wrong, when the reverse ABC pattern is not looking likely for now, why would you take the risk and average down and hope to revive a dying trade? Or a losing trade, I should say, because it still has time. It could recover. So for now, we leave it as it is. I have the 300 puts for the expiration date in November. But if Goldman Sachs goes down, closes the gap, and closes the day below the gap, then we're talking. Then there are prospects of managing the trade and doing some repair by averaging down and the trade will become profitable but for now fighting a losing trade is a bad strategy move on and speaking of moving on how about the daily heat map for the etfs a sea of green no major contrast between growth and value yet again a sign of the short covering slash algorithmic rally Yet we have some distinctive ad performers today, be it the EWZ, the Brazilian ETF in internationals. And we also have an ad performance by Materials ETF, the XLB, the XME, Financials, this is not a surprise, the XLF, with major gains for the week so far. And I am keeping an eye on the XHB, this is the Home Builders ETF, and I'm keeping an eye on the IYR, the Real Estate ETF. And the reason is, if yields go down for good, we're talking about the 10-year, you will see the XHB along with the IYR are performing tremendously so keep an eye on these two and yields and how they perform together because on the other hand if the 10 year makes a higher high these two will go down big so let's see if yields are about to make higher highs by visiting the charts analysis and we begin with the spy 30 minutes chart for the s p 500 and the first question is is the abc pattern completed for now the answer is yes the abc pattern is done it reached the target of 373 and a half and it pulled back from that point on. Now what? The bears would argue that we're seeing a formation of a reverse ABC pattern, which should take us all the way down to the June bottom. However, the bulls would say not so fast, because the support of 368 is tested twice, and it is holding. So we might have a double bottom, and a move higher from this point on. Now the question is, who has the better argument? And the answer is the bulls, because the support of 368 is still intact. If that's gone, the bears will start to gain more advantage. On to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. What's going on here? More advances by the bulls. The momentum indicators are moving higher. And most importantly, the volume moved higher on a green day. Yet the problem is, a lot of that volume came when the flush down happened by Apple. A lot of selling produce that volume and hence the devil is in the details but the most important advancement that the bulls made today is recapturing the support line of 3720 and a half for now the resistance of the top of the reversal candle at around 3820 will act as stiff resistance it will be difficult to break above so keep an eye on this level because even though if we get a gap higher again let's say in tomorrow's session or we get all the way to that point the risk versus reward will say at that point that the market it will pull back because it is one surprise away one unpleasant surprise away from flushing down and this unpleasant surprise could come from tesla bombing earnings it could happen next week for more important names not more important than tesla but certainly more important than the names that reported earnings this week so i am keeping an eye 
on 3820. And then we have the Qs, 30 minutes chart. The same goes here. The ABC pattern is done. The argument is this could be a bear flag or beginning of a reverse ABC pattern. But for now, the support of the June bottom, 269.29 is intact. So we cannot say that the bears have any advantage here, even though the chart closed at the lows of the day. But until the support is gone, we cannot say that we have a confirmation that the attempt to continue the rebound rally is over yet. You cannot say that for certain. So the assumption for now is the bulls will get us all the way to retest the top of the candle that we got today. Or if it passes that threshold, it goes all the way to the next resistance at around 280. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs. Unlike the SPY, it did not recapture any important support level. It remains within range. The June bottom is support and 11,689 as resistance. So for now, range bound. A lot of folks are excited about the day or two worth of rallies that we got, but all in all, the queues remains within range. Yes, the volume is up, but we had some funny activities today. Yes, the momentum indicators are reversing indeed, they're moving higher, producing positive impressions when it comes to the MACD and reversing the negative divergence when it comes to the RSI, but for now, the action remains neutral. The bears take the advantage once we see the June bottom violated once again. The bulls take the advantage once they pass and recapture 11,689 as support once again. Here's the IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000. Similar story here, the algos are trading the market pretty much on par. Therefore, we see the same pattern in the SPY, the Qs, the IWM. In the case of the IWM, it did close below the used to be support, now resistance at around 174.22, which is an important support, important resistance. And for now, the chart did not violate the lows of the day. It did not make a new lower low. So for now, the hopes are, at least for the bulls, that this is a double bottom formation. And higher we go, and by the end of the day tomorrow, we will see 174.22 as support. But what if the opposite happens? Let's identify some important levels here. If 174.22 is recaptured as support, the top of the gap and crap candle at around 177.29 becomes the next resistance. But if the chart goes down, then the gap below at 172.15 becomes the next support. For now, the 30 minutes chart is showing negative divergence here, indicating that we could see yet another gap and crap or a close closer to 172.15 versus 177.29. So slight bearish momentum here in the IWM, but it is not significant yet at least not for now. And maybe the confirmation will come from the next chart. We're talking about the daily chart for the Dixie, the dollar index. For now, no update really. And the trajectory remains the same, that this is a reverse ABC pattern. And we are amidst the formation of the C leg. We have a negative divergence in the RSI, indicating that the momentum is weak, at least for now. But yet we don't have a confirmation that the ABC pattern is in the bag. We're talking about the reverse ABC pattern. And the reason is, number one, the support of 111 and a half is intact. Number two, the trend line remains intact. And number three, look at gold, a leading indicator for the US dollar. Gold is not giving us any confirmation that this is over and the dollar will go down. If anything, gold is saying, hey, watch out. This might be another fake out, another possum being played by the dollar. This assumption goes out of the way if gold recaptures the important support of 1,671 and better yet, 1,000. 685. Then what about Brent oil? We're talking about a daily chart here. Are the hopes of an ABC pattern dead now? The answer is not quite. Yet we need to see a positive reaction in this chart by tomorrow. If it doesn't happen, say goodbye to the ABC pattern. But as we said in the beginning of the program, we have a positive catalyst here for oil to move higher. And this is the release from the SPR. And then we have the 10-year yield, the daily chart. It is still consolidating at around the resistance of the top of the range. For now, is the chart trading closer to the top of the range or the bottom of the range? The answer is closer to the top of the range. And if you don't have your glasses on, this is a good time to put them on. Since the chart is closer to the top of the range, yields bulls have the advantage here that the chart will make higher highs. This assumption goes out of the way if the chart goes down all the way closer to the lower end of the range, and better yet break below that end of the range, then we'll say, okay, the double bottom or the double top, I should say, 
is here. Absent of that, this chart is forming yet another positive ABC pattern and it will make higher highs. Now, what about the TLT 30 minutes chart? What's going on here? We have a downtrend and the chart is having a hard time breaking above this downward trend. But the good news is the chart rallied higher today and it managed to close above the flush down candle, the breakdown candle, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. What's important is the chart closed above it. And this is a positive sign. It is not the all clear sign because we still have the downward trend of resistance. And yes, we're seeing more bullish activities in the options market. The call options volume is surging for the TLT. This is, of course, yet another bet that the Fed is going to pivot. I don't see why the pivot is going to happen. I only see the pivot happening if there is a financial financial accident if there is a disaster and it's not going to be bullish for equities maybe bullish for the TLT but not necessarily for equities here's the VIX four hours chart what's going on here on one hand you could say hey the S&P 500 is rallying aggressively yet we're not seeing an aggressive reaction to the downside by the VIX this could be an indicator that whatever this rally is a bear market rally a rebound rally a rescue rally a PPT rally doesn't matter what it is it's not long lasting however the bulls equities bulls will look at this chart and say wait a minute here we have a trend line that is now broken. We have negative momentum on the MACD indicator and the RSI. This should move the VIX down and in a period of time, it will make lower lows. Just be patient. This is the argument by equities bulls and I would say, at least for now, it is becoming more persuasive, but we need to see more. And here's Apple, a daily chart. What's going on here? The volume went higher on the selling side. The majority of the volume in Apple came during the flush down. With that being said, the chart did not register any new negative activity or any reversal or any sign that it should go from this point on. And this is all the juice that this rebound rally has. Because number one, the chart closed above the previous resistance at around the gap. You can see the line in yellow. Number two, the chart did make higher highs. Number three, the momentum indicators are improving and they are producing positive reactions. We can see the green impression in the histogram of the MACD, for example. But the problem remains the chart did not close above 145. And this number will continue to be a stiff resistance for Apple to pass above. And even if it does, you still have the epic battle of 150. I seriously doubt that Apple will make it above 150 given the bad news that we got today. There is more bad news to come. Now, when we zoom in to a 30 minutes chart for Apple, what do we see here? We see an ABC pattern that indeed played out, but then came the rescue at the end of the day, or let's say the dismissal of the news that it is an isolated supplier, it's just one supplier, and the buyers did show up and closed above the resistance, now support in yellow. So yes, the bears did fire a warning shot today. They did make a splash, a little one today, saying, hey, we're here, we did not leave, and we can flush this chart down. But it's just a warning shot. It is not a decisive closing in by the bears saying, hey, we're about to take the advantage now. We're not seeing this yet. We will see it if we see number one, a clear rejection from 145. Number two, closing the gap and a failure to rebound around 138.79. We're not there yet. Keyword yet. And then what about Tesla and hourly chart? What's going on here? We got the bull flag playing out, but we talked about 226.26 as stiff, really stiff resistance. And the chart could not make it above this number. It peaked above it and flushed down right away. And now it is forming a bear flag pattern at around 217.88. So for now, the technicals say down we go. But we have an important catalyst coming out tomorrow, and that is earnings after the bell. So can we say that with certainty that Apple should go down and close the gap and violate the support of 206.86 before earnings? Not sure. I think earnings will dictate the move here. So we will do an earnings preview for Tesla right in the conclusion of this video. But for now, what about Bitcoin? Anything new for BTC? Not really. It did reach the top of the range of the consolidation, but then moved down until and unless we see a break above 20,000. And we mean a decisive one, we're not going to be in. Until we see a break below 18,000, we're not going to be shorting here. So instead, let's talk about two new bonus charts. And the catalyst for these charts is this one right here. We know that diesel prices are moving significantly higher. 
And with that comes also the margins of oil refiners. Matter of fact, the refiners are seeing the best margins ever in history. Therefore, I did add two new names to my portfolio. And again, when the recession happens, all of these charts will go down. But for now, can you ride on the wave of the momentum that these names are enjoying? The answer is yes, you could. And we start with the ticker MPC Marathon Petroleum. Believe it or not, the bullish trend in this name remains intact. That's number one. Number two, it did make higher low. Number three, it is now eyeing the previous top. It is maintaining all of these Fibonacci support levels. The momentum is improving, be it in the RSI or the MACD. And this is a weekly chart. So when we look at the chart, the assumption is at least it should give it a shot in retesting the top once again. And there is no doubt that it will face some resistance at the top. So you don't have to buy right away. You can wait for the retest of the top, see how it behaves. If it passes the top, then we have the all clear that this will make higher highs. And once that happens, once the previous top is defeated, there's plenty of room in the RSI, the MACD indicators for the chart to move significantly higher. Now, how do I know that I'm wrong here? If the chart makes a new lower low in the pattern, and that would be by violating the most immediate Fibonacci support. And then the other chart is VLO Valero. This is yet another weekly chart. Look at the MACD indicator. It is about to cross. It is about to produce positive momentum. Green impressions in the histogram. The chart made a triple bottoming formation, retesting support over and over and over again. And to my eye, the chart is now ready to retest the top once again. You can wait till the retest of the top, but for me, I've seen enough. I'm ready to go in and go all the way and retest the top, being in the name, not waiting in the sidelines. Now, how do I know that I'm wrong if the chart violates the triple bottoming formation? And that happens to be around the 100 level. Now let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have important data for the housing market. We have building permits and housing starts. Then we have the beige book by the Fed. And on top of that, we have more Fed zombies speaking, mainly the demon from Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari. And of course, the most dovish Fed member right now, Charles Evans from Chicago. Now, what about the earnings calendar? We have, most importantly, Tesla, IBM, Travelers Insurance, Procter & Gamble, the Nasdaq, and LAM Research. Now, I don't have to say that Tesla is the most important one, and Tesla is down big since the highs in November, down 50%. So the expectations are down in the toilet that the growth is slowing down. But we have some elements of surprise here. Number one, Reverend Elon Musk did tease a buyback program. I think it's misguided. I think the company should concentrate in using the cash to secure more supplies and stay ahead of the competition, not to use the cash and share buybacks. But if it is announced, it could be a positive catalyst to ignite a rally in Tesla, regardless of what the results are going to say. However, we have another wild card here, and it happens to be a bearish one this time around, which is we know that Elon Musk needs to sell some stock in Tesla. And this is related to the Twitter deal, so we know the who, the why, the when, but we have no idea how much. Is he going to dump $2 billion? Is it going to be $5 billion, $10 billion? It doesn't matter, in my opinion. If Elon dumps again, it's not going to be $2 billion. It's going to be $5 billion plus. So this will be a negative catalyst for Tesla to go down further. But here's a leading indicator from a fundamental perspective. We got the results from a competitor of Tesla in China, BYD. And the numbers were really impressive. The unit sales were sky high. So is this a leading indicator that EV sales in China are recovering? And if it is, the assumption is it includes Tesla. On the other hand, is it a leading indicator that the Chinese consumer is shunning Tesla in favor of Chinese producers? We know that the Chinese consumer is becoming increasingly anti-American. If it is the latter, it will be bad news for Tesla, not good news. And folks, with that, this is all I got for you for now. Once again, thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and most importantly, thank you for your support. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Take care. They all think you're, you're deaf and dumb. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you fooled them, Chief. <laughs> you fooled them, you fooled them all. <laughs> yeah.